All right, guys, what's up? We're back again, fresh from the PGA Championship I was at today uh, at Southern Hills in Tulsa. Going to do a little emergency pod. You know, this is obviously called the Showdown Hoedown, so we focus more on Showdown. But today, I would say Showdown's going to kind of just get stuck at the end. I got some uh, week-long stuff uh, to cover and, uh, you know, some weather and some advice to give you on week-long. Because if you don't know, I play week-long pretty competitively, too. I just seem to win a lot more at Showdown than I do at week-long. First of all, uh, please when I put this on YouTube, go subscribe to my YouTube page. I got like 250 subscribers. I'm well on my way to getting to a thousand. I got to be at a thousand before the open championship so that I can win a nice large bet with a couple of friends, which will be great because I always lose my ass at the open championship, but they'll be covering it that week because I'll be getting all that money when I get to a thousand subscribers. And I know I, there's like a thousand of you watching. Cause I saw how many people watch the last video and I see how many people are coming over here from Twitter. So just like go subscribe for me, please. Thank you. And if you leave a comment, that's cool too. Um, just trying to grow the page, help some people organically find it that don't live in our little DFS, uh, PGA DFS community. So do that for me. Uh, all right. Uh, let's just, let's, let's go. Uh, we're going to start out with the most pressing thing. Cause there's nobody that loves a good, uh, wind slash weather wave play than me. Uh, when I was making my player pool last night, I had pretty much decided that I was going all in on this whole, uh, AM PM narrative. But then, uh, thank God, I remembered that I live in Oklahoma, and that's stupid as shit. Because if you don't know the running joke around Oklahoma is like, why do weathermen even get paid? Because they're wrong half the time. They're just guessing. They don't really know. And you get up and you look at Windfinder today, which, by the way, if you're not aware, I'm looking at uh, Richard Lloyd Jones uh, Airport. It's in Southside Tulsa, which is where Southern Hills is. Uh, it has almost changed completely for tomorrow. Now it looks like the the most gusty weather, which, you know, I, that's what most of the golfers tend to want to avoid are those big gusts are actually going to be in the a.m. tomorrow. So it was the whole narrative was is these big winds were going to roll in in the afternoon and that the afternoon guys were going to get slaughtered and then they have to deal with those terrible winds Friday. you got to play the a.m. p.m. guys. And I was all about that. But uh, it seems to have changed a little bit. Um, you know, now when you look at uh, Windfinder, it, it shows it being pretty blustery both mornings. So what I'm seeing here is it does still probably, if I had to guess, there's going to still probably be a slight uh, wave advantage for the AM PM just because I really do think Friday morning is going to be pretty nasty out there for at least the first five to six holes that a lot of the guys are out there. But am I ready to go all in on it? No. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use it as a tiebreaker. If I like, you know, I like, there's two $7,200 guys I like, but I'm trying to get my player pool down to a number of uh, guys I'm comfortable with. I'm going to cut the guy that is uh, on the wave that I perceive that might be uh, less advantageous. So as far as week long goes, I'm just using wind as a breakdown or as a, as a tiebreaker because when the, it can change. And the worst thing you can do is go all in on Oklahoma weather and going all in on Oklahoma weather. Uh, you might as well just go play some craps cause you're just straight up gambling at that point. Um, so I would tell you, do not get off guys you like simply because you think they're in the perceived wrong wave. Um, uh, I, and I'm glad I saw this too, because I was, there was a lot of guys I was X and off last night that was making me cringe. And I was like, I want to play this guy. Um, and I was talking myself out of it simply because of the wind. Furthermore, always use more than one source. Look at this. You can, you, everybody's heard of Windfinder because, you know, some of the biggest names in the industry touted up. But what about Willy Weather? You ever heard of it? I actually kind of like it more and I find it more reliable. And it's still kind of going with that same narrative that is going to be pretty gentle tomorrow and then pick up throughout the day. Um, so if you go off this one, it does still seem like the uh, AM PM is going to have the advantage, but they have those nice fresh winds tomorrow sticking around well into the afternoon. Um, and if you don't know, just generally speaking, courses always play easier in the morning before the course has had time to break, it, uh, you know, dry out and the bake out is the word I'm looking for. And the greens have, you know, got hard to land on. So, you know, tomorrow I do expect those guys to probably shoot a little bit better score, assuming those gusts aren't too nasty. You know, I watched probably 50 shots a day and those guys were just tearing that course apart, but there was like hardly a gust in the air. So, uh, this course does need some wind or I think this whole, you know, it might play at minus four to minus seven. It might be nonsense. If it, if it was like it is today, the winning score will be at least minus 12. I promise. Um, but maybe those Friday, those Friday morning wins will just annihilate some people. Um, and then, you know, if you just want one more source, how about just good old weather channel? And you can just kind of go look at the hourly breakdown. Um, I will tell you that Willie weather and, uh, the weather channel don't tend to be as dynamic and how much they change. You know, I, I promise you tonight when I go check Windfinder again at 8 PM tonight, it's going to say something different. It tends to be a little bit more, uh, moody and fluctuaty. So, you know, just monitor that, but you know, always use more than one good source. 
All right, let's uh, let's get to a couple things I saw today. Uh, I've seen some news floating around about, around Hideki. Um, you know, I, I I saw him on the course today. He hit one in twelve, uh, stuck it to probably thirteen feet, and then he tossed a couple balls in the bunker and was hitting some balls out of the bunker. Looked fine. Watched him tee off on thirteen, which is a really long par five where they tee off over the twelfth green. Um, he looked fine to me, uh, but. Rather, rather he is looking good or looking bad. Hideki's gonna probably be like the second most popular player, even with this news floating around that his neck hurts. Uh, you know, as uh, as my my dude Tambo said, you know, like we kind of live in an echo chamber where we're hearing this stuff, but ninety five percent of the public isn't hearing it, and so they're not on that. They're just gonna see a really good player in Hideki who has really good form, who just smashed Sunday, is coming in playing a tough course. They're going to want to play him. I bet Hideki is without question one of the three most highly owned players, and I wasn't going to play him. And now you give me just a little bit of a rumor uh, that he might have a neck injury. I'm definitely out. Although, as Andy pointed out, Andy Lack, that uh, you know, last time he played this whole, ooh, I'm hurt, he went out and smashed the Zozo. So take that for what it's worth. But generally speaking, I'll get into this in a minute. I'm just fading chalk. And Decky is chalk, so no thank you. Uh, things I saw from the course today. Uh, I mean, obviously it's a beautiful course. Uh, you know, my legs are killing me cause I feel like I walked up about 500 flights of stairs today. Um, things that stuck out to me, uh, it is a, let me tell you this. I'm really good at fantasy golf. I'm not particularly a great golfer, probably above average, but definitely not like some golf snob that's amazing at golf. But if I were playing that course, I was very underwhelmed by how difficult the tee shots were very wide fairways, very inviting fairways, not, you know, not tricky bunkers, not hard dog legs, um, just very not intimidating tee shots. Um, and then I put a video on Twitter today, uh, talking about some of the rough. If you didn't see me on Twitter today, I did one over uh, tiger. You can see here, Luke list missing a putt. I know. Let me do my shock face. Uh, we had cam Smith who, uh, you know, I guess I'll just go ahead and doubt that's my play for this week. That's my one dude. That's the only name I'll give you that I'm playing this week. I love him. Uh, I had some Russell Henley hitting over the T boxes here, like the T boxes going over the greens. Um, and then here was the one, uh, my update number five was me dropping it in the rough here. And as you can see, this is about as thick as rough as I saw all day. So it's not particularly punitive rough there. Um, the biggest thing that I would say, the only thing you really have to worry about with your drive here is those fairway bunkers. I saw more than one player get in those fairway bunkers, and they were not happy with the shots they were hitting out of them. I couldn't really find a good spot to get over to the fairway bunkers, but for what I'm seeing from Ian Poulter and some people that are in the know is the fairway bunker uh, sand is much more dense and rocky almost, uh, and those rocks are getting in between their ball and their clubs. You know, I don't hit the ball pure enough to really know what the hell they're talking about, but I'm, I'm going to assume they do. Uh, and the stuff on the green side, I heard it was very pure, and it looked like players were not struggling too much to get up and down from there. Uh, well, at least the good ones weren't. Uh, uh, other things that stood out to me from the golf course was how difficult and intimidating the second shots were. When you're in the fairway looking at the greens, every green looks so tiny. It is surrounded by bunkers. And at least on just, what, four or five of the holes I saw, it seems like there's just a creek meandering right around it. I mean, just truly terrifying shots. Um, so I am going to be playing this as a second shot golf course. I'm going to be targeting guys who are good from those key proximity ranges that I think they're going to be hitting a lot of shots at, which I actually, you'll be surprised, I think is going to be more like 100 to 150 is going to be the kind of sweet spot where most of these approaches are coming in. And then I want guys who can get up and down around the green. The overwhelming uh, narrative that I've heard so far this week is everybody wants bombers. You got to have bombers. This course plays super long. I disagree. I really do. Uh, I, I think uh, I would rather, you know, that's, that's how I'm going to separate myself from everybody else. Everybody else wants to go play the bombers. Go give me the guys who can manufacture around. I mean, what better proof can I give you than my favorite play this week is Cam Smith. I'm just on team Cam Smith. I want guys like Cam Smith. Um, is that a chance I'm going to be wrong? Absolutely. I'm wrong all the time, but I know that I am playing a narrative that not other people are playing and I'm not just doing it simply to be different. I'm doing it because that's actually kind of what I saw in the stats and then what I saw today at the course. So that's how I'm rolling. I'm not telling you to do it. As I always tell you, make your own damn picks. Okay. I'm just telling you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Uh, all right. Uh, as far as just some like basic strategy goes, uh, I'm going to, you know, try to give you a different perspective. You know, I assume if you're listening to me, you probably listen to a lot of different, uh, people out there talk about this stuff, but you know, I probably play, uh, you know, a little bit different than a lot of the guys you listen to, you know, I'll max the, the Millie maker this week. I'll max the $5. I'll play a single, a single entry in some of the higher level stuff. So, you know, 
I, I'm kind of playing at a different level than a lot of those guys. And trust me, that doesn't make me more right than them, right? Uh, it just means I have a different perspective than them. You know, I play the high limit stuff and I play the low limit stuff. Uh, I basically just play whatever contest I think suits my eye. Uh, and there's not a lot of dudes in the industry that play at that level that are giving this advice. So maybe this will sound a little different. But here's my general takeaway what I'm going to do this week. There are two tournaments every year that just absolutely wreck chalk. And it is the Open Championship which is coming up in July, and the PGA Championship. And it's no surprise they're majors, so they try to make these courses tough. And when you make a course tough, you're going to wreck chalk. That's what's going to happen. And so here we are, like we're always doing, we're trying to project what's going to be the, the, the best type of player, who's going to play the best on this course, and we're all just projecting. And no one really knows, just like we're projecting the weather. This wave's going to do better than this wave. This guy plays better in the wind than this guy. But we don't really know. All we're doing is projecting. So if we're all going to project, and really, we have very little you know, answers as to what's going to be right, why not just stay away from the chalk? Just stay away from the chalk. And I promise you, there will be four or five guys over 15% this week that will just straight up bomb and we'll miss the cut, and we'll wreck so many lineups. And when, if you're playing in the Millie Maker or the big $5 this week, you got to beat 117,000 lineups. Ask yourself what's easier, to beat 117,000 lineups, to pick the six absolute nut plays, or to just hope 95% of people fuck up, pick the wrong chalk, and now you just have to beat five to 10,000 people to take home a mega prize. Uh, this, is, this is probably the one piece of advice that like, I never hear anybody give. But don't take pride in your picks. We all make our little models. We all want to feel confident about our picks and say, oh, look, I focused on the right stats and feel good about yourself. When really, you got to remember we're playing a game. And when you're playing a game, you're just trying to gain a mathematical edge any way you can. So put your pride in making the, the, the best picks to the side. You know, like there's guys that I love this week. Uh, of course, I love Patrick Cantlay. Of course I do. He seems like a great fit. I mean, Cantley is a bulldog. He plays tough course as well. He is decent in all aspects of the game. He checks every box you would want to see for a guy. But he's 22% owned. Whereas Brooks Kepka, right there in the exact same price range, is going to be like legit 5 or 6% owned. Are you telling me Patrick Cantley is four times more likely to outproduce? outproduce Brooks Kepka because if you truly believe that send me a DM and give me four to one odds and I'll bet any amount of money you'll let me uh it's just not the case that's just bad game theory to do it that way so what I'm doing and I'm not telling you to do this I'm telling you what what I'm doing and why I'm doing it is I'm fading all chalk if you don't know what the chalk is Go get on the website. Fanshare is good. Uh, 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 Greenback Greg, I believe, does the tau meter. They'll give you a pretty good idea. Or, you know, if you're on Fantasy National, which you know I have not been the biggest fan of, just simply go click on these players and see who's in the red here. And as you can see, who's coming in the highest? No surprise. It's Decky, Rory, Spieth, Lowry, Thomas, Willie Z, Scheffler, Cantlay. All these guys. And they're all very good plays on paper. They all seem very good. And out of all those dudes right there in the red, all of them. I'm going to play one of them, maybe two. There's plenty of other good players that are up there that have just as much upside as these guys that are going to come in at one third or one half of the ownership. If I were playing my $3,000 single entry like I did last week, I'd probably have a different theory, but I'm playing 117,000 people in the $25 million Millie maker. So I've got to like really mix it up. Now, am I going to go play a guy I hate simply just to be different? No. But if I'm already kind of interested in Brooks Kepka and he's going to be 5% owned, well, then Brooks Kepka is a smash play. That's a smash play. And that's what I'm going to do. Do I like Rory? Yeah, I do. Am I going to play Rory and Spieth? Probably not. I'm probably going to play somebody like Brooks or something like that, or maybe Dustin or Morikawa or whoever I end up coming up with my final ownership projections that are going to be the lowest. And then, you know what I'm going to hope for? I'm going to hope for chaos. And if there is a bunch of chaos and a bunch of those top guys miss the cut or dick around and get T58 and, you know, one of these low owned guys goes and wins it like Patrick Reed did at the Masters a few years ago, I have all the leverage I need to win the GPP. And, when I'm playing for the millionaire maker, I want first place or I want dead fucking last. And that's how I'm going to play. I'll, I'll, I'll put a picture out Sunday of my lineups and you'll see. I bet you'll see all 150 of my lineups way at the back of the screen, nowhere near the green. Or you'll see a whole bunch of bullets up there in the top 100. It's the same way I play showdown. I'm going to have a, a, a tight core of guys that not everybody's on, just like it was Xander and Decky last Sunday. And I'm just going to smash those plays. And if they come through, I'm going to have lots and lots of bullets up at the top of that thing with a chance to win real money. And if I don't, 
don't, well, then I'll lose. And that's okay. I'm okay playing that way. I'm not trying to like min cash and get back, you know, 3000 of the $5,000 I put in or whatever that number is. That's just, that's not how I play. And I don't think that's how any real profitable player plays. So be willing to go down in flames. And I'm willing to do that. Even if that includes fading all of the chalk. So that's what I'm doing. And yes, I have some prides in my picks too. Justin Thomas absolutely kills my model. He is number one in almost everything. And I'm not going to play him. I'm not going to play him because he's going to probably be the second highest owned player. At least top three. <sighs> okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about contest selection. I've, I've had a couple people ask me about that. Uh, when it comes to contest selection, I would say that you need to focus on what you want to do. Last week, I only liked about eight guys. So if you, there's only like eight guys you really feel good about, you should really just be doing like a, a single entry or maybe like a three max and then just kind of mix in a match in those, those guys you like. But this week, when I'm predicting chaos, you know, this and it's a chaotic week. Well, I don't want to put all of my eggs into one basket or even just a small basket of like a, a like a, a three max or something like that. So I'm putting that's why I'm putting 150 in the Millie Maker and 150 in the five dollar. And then I'll probably make one lineup I feel really good about that I'll put in all the single entries. Why am I doing it that way? Because I think it's going to be chaos this week. And if it's going to be chaos, I don't want to just have a few guys. I want to have a bunch of shots that the chaos that I somehow rise out of the chaos because I have 300 lineups. That's how I'm doing it. Uh, if you think you have a really good pick and you have eight to 10 guys you like, just go play three lineups and, and just mix and match those guys and make your lineups work that way. If there's a whole bunch of guys you want to play, or you feel like this is a week that the chalk might explode because it's a major and it's difficult and majors more than any other tournament are super variable. And please don't say the masters because the masters is not a traditional major in that it's always played at the same course. It's the only major that's played at the same course. So of course there's a lot of predictive value. So if you say, man, I faded the chalk at the masters. I got my ass burned. Well, yes, because like the masters is probably like one of the most predictable tournaments out there as far as course history mattering but none of these guys none of these guys have played southern hills and the ones that have were like was that 14 15 years ago uh it doesn't matter so it's almost like a brand new course so there's going to be a little bit of carnage there's definitely going to be some chaos and what we all think we know about the weather or what's a good play or what type of player is going to do well is largely just us projecting our own bullshit. That's really what it is. Uh, and I encourage you not to do that. Just swallow your pride and realize that you're playing a game and it's about who's being the best at that game, not who can make the best golf picks. I know, it's counterintuitive. Um, anything else for contest selection? If you're going to play the Millie Maker, uh, man, you've got to just like go look at who's going to be the highest owned and at least throw four or five of those top 10 guys out. Just automatically don't have them in your player pool. Because if you have the 10 most owned guys, even if you did 150 lineups, you're going to get duped. Or even if you don't get duped, you're going to have the exact same four players as another guy. Uh, and then you're going to be playing 2v2s. And do you really want to be playing 2v2s versus 1,000 people to try to get a prize? Absolutely not. You know, I just did my one lineup last week, and I picked the six guys I like, but sadly they were all kind of chalky. And I was in a tournament that only had 134 people, and me and Mock Lovin had the exact same lineup except for one guy. I had Lonto, he had Mito. Um, and you don't want to have that. Like, I don't want to be playing the best DFS player in the world with a 1v1. That's that's just not, that, that's not good odds for me. Uh, so, you know, in, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have just done the one lineup because then you end up just getting on your favorite plays and favorite plays tend to usually be pretty chalky. All right. Uh, one more thing I've been wanting to cover because, you know, I get a lot of requests for people for me to cover things and seeing this isn't my traditional, I'm focusing on showdown like I do in my other ones. Uh, I figured this would be a good one to try to hit some of these random points that people have asked me to hit player pool size. Every time I hear this question on all the big, uh, the big hosts, uh, you know, that do DFS content, they always say, nah, there's not a right answer. Do it your way. I disagree. I think there is a right answer. I think that player pools, you know, if you're playing to win the long game here, you're okay losing, uh, you know, 75 to 80% of weeks, you should have a tight player pool. If you are playing three lineups, you should probably not have any more than like 10 players. A lot of people I know that probably the most common number that people play is 20, 20 lineups. They like to play that 20, uh, 20 max $3 or something like that. Or they'll throw a 20 in the Millie Maker or 20 in the $5. They're cool playing $100 a week, which is a very, you know, a very good number. 20 is a good number because it allows you to kind of get those exposures. And when you do 20 lineups, you probably never want to have more than 18 guys in that. And within that 18 guys, you're always going to want to make sure that you have at least every guy in three of those lineups. 
Because if you don't have a guy in at least 15% of your lineups, which would be three of the 20, you're not getting enough exposure. You know, you don't, you're going to, if that one guy does smash for you and you have him in one lineup, well, now you have to have the other five guys perfect for it to hit. Whereas if you have that guy in three lineups and he's that 1% guy that smashes, now you have multiple chances for him to be in a lineup that could win you a GPP or get you a really high smash in a GPP. If you're doing 150 lineups like I am this week, I think the number you want is somewhere around 35. I don't think you really ever want to get over 35 and you want to make sure that you play every player in at least 10% of your lineups. That's my number. That's how I do it. You know, uh, if, if that's a little too aggressive for you, then just remember the two X rule that I always talk about, whatever the projected ownership is on somebody, go play them at two X that, right? So if you see somebody is projecting at 12%, make sure you have them at least 24% of your lineups. And if you do that, that'll always keep you the leverage. Um, and when you do it that way, that will always make sure to keep your player pool tight, because if you play three or four chalky guys, you're going to run out of that percentage really quick and you can only go up, you know, to 600% because you get a hundred for all six spots. Uh, I am going to be playing 301 lineups this week. I'm going to do 150, uh, in the $5, 100, 150 different ones in the, in the Millie maker. And then I'm going to just do my one single entry that I put in everything. And in that player pool right now, I have about 40 eight players, but I still got to make my final cuts. I'll probably cut it down to 42 to 40, 40 to 42 players. And even that is like, Oh, I can't believe I'm playing so many guys, but with 300 lineups, you have to have enough to mix and match and make it work. Uh, so that, that, you know, to me, those are kind of the correct numbers. If you are playing three lineups a week and you play 18 guys, you just, you're never going to win. And if you do, if you do win, you will be like, ah, oh, see, I won. Yeah. Some people do win. Just like some people do win the lottery. That doesn't mean you did it right. That just means you got lucky. That's all it means. So if you're wanting to do this and win time after time after time, and by that, I mean like two or three times a year, if you're really fucking awesome at DFS golf, uh, then you need to have that process of keeping a tight, consistent player pool. Uh, and knowing how to mix and match those guys. Cause it doesn't matter if you have 18 guys and you're and three of those guys, you're only playing once. Well, that doesn't really do you much good. You want to make sure you have proper exposure to every player in your pool. And you want to make sure that that pool is nice and tight. And it needs to be where you can replicate lineups very similar. So you need to have players in kind of those different ranges. You need to have, you know, a handful of guys from 6,500 to 6,900, the 7,000 to the 7,500, the, you know, all those different ranges so that you can mix and match players. Well, you can't just go pick all 20 of your players and have them all be above 8K because you're not going to be able to make any fucking lineups. Okay. Um, last thing, uh, showdown. It is the showdown hoedown. I guess I should probably talk about uh, showdown. Let's see. On showdown tomorrow, I don't really like it. As we said, we're not really sure what the weather is going to be tomorrow. You would think that the morning uh, wave would have an advantage. If I were going to play showdown tomorrow, I would gamble and I would play the afternoon. Why? Because there's enough, the kind of people that play showdown, right? Like it's the hardos that, that play showdown. Like it's not going to be like, oh, I'll just go try the showdown guy that doesn't know anything about weather advantages. 80% of the people in it are going to know that the AM is supposedly going to have the better draw tomorrow. They're going to have the softer greens tomorrow. So looking here, it does appear, uh, does appear as though there is a chance the better scoring waves will be in the afternoon tomorrow. That would be enough of an edge for me to take a chance on. I'm not playing round one showdown. I personally don't like it. I got my week long lineups to sweat and you know, Thursday, everybody's live on Thursday, right? So I, you know, I only play showdown on round one for one of two reasons. There's gotta be an overlay or I see some very clear, distinct advantage that other people aren't seeing. Uh, I don't really see that. I, I, you know, maybe I'll be right about the afternoon plays better tomorrow, but I wouldn't bet any money on it. I don't feel confident enough and I already have so much money invested in my week long. I'll just save that till Friday where I think it's pretty clear there's going to be a edge wave. And I'll obviously save it for this weekend um, where, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't going to know how to find the correct stats to look at for this uh, weekend uh, for round three and round four showdown. And that's where we'll really hammer showdown hard and try to, you know, win again. Because if you haven't noticed, the last two showdown hoedowns I put out, we definitely, uh, I definitely tipped off the nuts on both days. And, uh, you know, I, I, I smashed it and I've gotten quite a few messages from people saying they smashed it, which is awesome. Cause I mean, people are listening. Okay. I feel like I've rambled long enough. This is just an emergency podcast. It wasn't meant to be long. I'm really trying to work on the length of these things. Um, if you have questions, hit me up on, uh, the degenerate 75 at Twitter, or how about you go subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a comment. Cause like I'm trying to grow that channel a lot more and I'm trying to grow my Twitter. Cause you know, I got to bet on it. 
So do that. I try to respond to everybody. Uh, don't blow off anybody. Uh, respond to DMs. Uh, I'm going to be at the tournament Saturday and Sunday, but I'll still try to put out a hoedown showdown Friday night and Saturday night for round three and round four. Um, thank you guys for listening and helping my channel grow. I really appreciate it. Give this a like. Subscribe. You know, like call up a friend, get them to subscribe, and I'll really appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys next time. Later.